Welcome to Compelling Conversation. I'm your host, Dush Ramachandran, and my guest today is a very special person I think you'll really enjoy meeting. Have you felt that in these difficult times, it is so hard to maintain a positive attitude? It's so hard to be positive, be cheerful, be happy, all of those things that people tell you to do. And there's, there's so much unhappiness around the world. There's uh, so much unrest and we have the pandemic that is that seems to be raging on and on there's all of these reasons why you might feel less than positive my guest today is going to change that upend that notion entirely and uh, please let uh, let me welcome to the show uh, a, a, an absolutely delightful person mitzi purdue but before I bring Mitzi on, let me tell you, this is one very special person. Mitzi is the member of two very, very famous families. Uh, her late husband was the founder of the Purdue poultry farm business, one of the largest, and now I think the third largest uh, poultry business in the United States. And um, she's also, uh, uh, the the daughter of the original founder of the Sheraton Hotel chain. Now, coming from that sort of a background, you can imagine Mitzi's got some great stories to tell, and we're going to love this. So, Mitzi, welcome. Oh, what a joy to be with you. Thank you so much. It's been an absolute pleasure talking to you, and I'm I'm really really so thrilled to share your wisdom and your bright light with our audience. So let's, let's get started. Now, um, one of the things that uh, sort of brought you to our attention was the fact that apart from being all these wonderful things, you've also co-written a book called How to Be Up in Down Times, which I think is extraordinarily timely for the situation we find ourselves in. And um, let's, let's talk a little bit about how you came to write the book. Uh, I know you co-wrote the book with uh, Preston Weeks and Mark Victor Hansen. Uh, and of course, Mark Victor Hansen needs no introduction having written Chicken Soup for the Soul and sold millions and millions of copies of his, uh, of his book. But uh, share with us what caused you to co-write this book at this time? The genesis of the book, and I'm gonna hold up a picture of it so that we know what we're talking about. It's how to be up and down times. And the, it began, the, the thinking for it began, how about in very late January? Because I have friends in China and it became on my radar that, that some horrible virus had, you know, was let loose on China. And I was hearing these stories about people locked in their buildings and I'm thinking, you know, viruses don't know borders. If the suffering that I hear about from people there spreads, and I couldn't think of any reason that it wouldn't, then we were up against some seriously hard times. So long about February, but how about really early February, I told Mark Victor Hansen, who's a personal friend, I said, we're gonna be up against some really down times. And you, sir, have an experience of being one of the more inspirational people in the world. Your books have sold half a billion with a B copies. You've written 309 books. Let's make it a 310th and share some of your wisdom with what I bring to the table. And you know, he's inspirational and has just a great big global view of everything. What I bring to the table is kind of a contrast to his but for most of my adult life, how about 40 years, I've been a science writer. I, you know, in my life, I was the most widely syndicated environmental writer. That was in the 1980s and 1980s, 1990s. And during that period, I was always interviewing scientists. And in the process, you know, I learned an awful lot about, how about psychology, about, about mood, about, just the effects of all sorts of things have on us. And then I also wrote the blog for the Academy of Women's Health. I wrote for Genetic Engineering and Biotechnology News. So I proposed to Mark, I'm a science writer. 
you're an inspirational speaker and writer. What if together we gave people tips for getting through the hard times? And then on top of that, I suggested to him, and he bought this idea. I said, when people are under a lot of stress, their attention span goes down. And so if we write a book, instead of you know a great big tome that's 300 pages long, what if it's only 100 pages long? What if it's 40 tips, each one of which is no longer than two pages, so that people can absorb it? And I told him, you know, I am a writer by trade. I will, my part of it, I'll write it in the form of stories that include tips. He bought the idea, and I think we had it out. It, uh, let me amend that. I'm, it's not that I think that we had it out. We had it out in three weeks. It meant 18 hour days for me. And, but Mark's such a brilliant writer and his steps on uh, Preston is so brilliant that we were just able to create this thing. And then one more point about it. We knew it was a $20 book, but we were writing it to be helpful. So we put it on Amazon for the lowest price that we could get from Amazon, which is $4.58. So it's deliberately low priced. And I'm proud as can be about it. That is absolutely wonderful. So uh, the book is now available on Amazon. Uh, it's $4.58. And uh, it, is, it is just such an incredibly uplifting book. And it's got a lot of stories and lots of, um, you know, tips and ideas. Um, you know, Rather than just talk about the tips, um, would you care to share maybe one or two tips with our audience? Um, what, what should you do when you feel down, as, as most people are feeling right now? They're, they're locked in their homes. Uh, you know, the, the, there was what seemed to be a dip in cases. Uh, you know, wearing masks has become a cultural uh, divide. There, there are people that uh, feel like wearing a mask is an infringement of their personal liberties. Uh, and so whether because of that or any other reason, the cases have started to spike up again. We seem to be going back into shutdowns. So there's a lot of reasons why uh, people could feel discouraged. People could feel disheartened. Um, so share with us a couple of thoughts, a couple of ideas on what they might do to lift themselves up. How, how, how can they feel up in a downtime? Okay, I'm as sympathetic as a person can be about how stressful this is, because between financial worry and health worries, good Lord, I mean, this is, I, I've heard people compare it to, to like being in solitary confinement or things that produce post-traumatic stress. I mean, this, is, this, is, this may be as high level as many of our listeners are gonna go through as far as just sheer stress. So what can you do? Well, one piece of advice I have, and I have this, I have it from a number of sources, but to bring it more to a personal level, I have a niece who runs a nursing home. And she says that we should never underestimate the toll that stress takes on us. And she, as an example of that, she says that caregivers are a third more likely to die than their patients because the stress of caregiving is so great. And so the advice, and I'm going to give it from a personal level, although there, I bet there are thousands of scientists who would speak in the same words as my niece does. But she said one of the most important things that you can do so that you're not constantly bathed in the stress hormones of cortisol and adrenaline and, and all these things that just take an enormous toll on your body. She said one of the most important things you can do is what she calls escape and I'll call respite, but give yourself at least an hour a day when you do something that just takes yourself away from it and gives your, your body a time to, to restore itself. And here are some of the ways that work. I can't know what will work for you, but I'll tell you what other people do. How about if, if there's a movie that you just love, uh, 
that, that really takes you away from things. And uh, James Bond does it for me. When I'm watching a James Bond movie, I am not thinking of the horrible things going on in this world. Uh, but but other, other ways, I know people that like sewing or video games or whatever it is. It's, it's, not, it's not a luxury, it's a necessity. Do something that takes you away. And then another tip that I highly recommend, and this comes from my background uh, in knowing about television programming. If you're finding that watching the news just takes you down deeper and deeper and deeper, how about that's not an accident? If you're a television programmer, the thing that's going to keep your audience glued to the screen are things that raise your stress level. I mean, I know about this because there was a million dollar research project. I was in television for a few years and my station was part of this research that said, you may hate what you're watching. You're, you're watching just violent, awful things that just bring you down, 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 and then down some more. But you won't change the channel because we're wired when there's a dangerous situation we're wired to stay alert and be involved. So my advice for that, if, if that rings true to you, that the, that the news is bringing you down, and I bet it does, put yourself on a news diet. How about 15 minutes a day and no more? Because if you have it on all the time and you can just watch all these things that are as distressing and adrenaline stress raising as possible, it's not good for you. So two major tips, put yourself on a news diet. I mean, know enough to know what's going on in the world, but don't, don't wallow in it, escape from it. And the other thing is make sure you give yourself an hour of rest for the day, whatever it does, whatever it does for you. I mean, maybe it's music, maybe it's poetry, uh, maybe it's watching sports reruns, whatever. It's not a luxury, it's a necessity. You know that those are two great pieces of advice and um, specifically for me you struck a chord when you spoke of James Bond movies. I happen to be a huge diehard James Bond fan oh. and, um, and I'll share a little personal story with you uh, which resonates very deeply with me. Um, when, when the very first James Bond movie came out uh, in 1962, that was Dr. No. Um, uh -huh. it, was, it was a spectacular movie and I was seven years old and uh, my dad took me to the movie. It was, it was not really uh, a movie meant for a seven-year-old child, but um, you know, he was, he was a big fan. He had read the James Bond books as I did later. Um, and so he said, this is, this is gonna be great, let's go. So we went to a Saturday matinee. Uh, and I remember to this day being completely enthralled uh, by all the goings on on the screen and been a diehard fan of James Bond ever since and watched every movie. I own every single James Bond movie yes. ever made uh, on DVD and on Blu-ray. And I'm going to share with you uh, a, a, an interesting little thing. So I'm going to move the camera around. So I don't know if you can see it very well, but on that wall over there, that is a Dr. No poster. That's, <laughs> yes, and that's sort of just above uh, a bar. And that was a present from my wife for, for my birthday. Uh. It was such a momentous uh, occasion for me. Um, and so it that movie carries a lot of uh, a lot of meaning, uh, and I've, I've always loved James Bond, and I think it's fabulous storytelling. Uh, it's, it's a great diversion, and certainly helps to take your mind off things. It's total escapism, and it's yeah. wonderful. Yeah, to my mind, it's a complete work of genius, because when you're watching Dr. No, or, or actually any of them, because- yeah, Thunderball, they, you know, from- no, Russia, Even the bad ones, you can't right. help but forgetting your troubles. I mean, I, I challenge you, you've got a relationship problem. Your, your wife, your girlfriend, your daughter, whoever is fighting with you, you feel awful. You can't think about that while you're watching James Bond. 
That's absolutely true. Um, and, you know, even though in the middle, uh, we're going to take a little detour and talk about James Bond because that's what we do. Uh, yeah. um, you know, in the middle, uh, after the Timothy Dalton years, um, you know, it, it kind of set into a bit of the doldrums and the, the movie franchise became a little camp. Um, but then I do believe that uh, Daniel Craig rescued the franchise and he yeah. has been an absolutely spectacular Bond, uh, the best, in my opinion, after Sean Connery. Um, so my gosh, we agree. That's that's exactly where I would rank them. I saw one with I'm trying to think of the name of it with Sean Connery recently, and you almost forget how fabulous he was for the role. Okay. Yeah, but Daniel Craig is up there. Yep, Daniel Craig is up there, and you know he's uh, his movies. Casino Royale was spectacular. That was his debut into the, uh, the Bond franchise. He did spectacularly well. Uh, the other movies have been great as well. Um, and uh, I'm, I'm waiting to see the most recent one, um, which uh, I think the release has been delayed. But it anyway, so that's a little, little detour into James Bond world. Uh, it's an absolutely spectacular diversion. And you're absolutely right you cannot but feel uplifted and just escape into some fun, uh, you know, enjoyment and, and get your mind away from, you know, the terrible news and what's happening in our country and so on and so forth. Uh, thank you and, for your advice. Yes, please go ahead. Well, as you're taking your mind away from all these catastrophes that are just descending on us, I mean, one worse than the next, uh, not only are you taking your mind away from it, you're taking your brain chemicals away from it. And that is healthy. Because yeah. if you have constant unrelieved stress, you're going to be one of those people who pays a price. So you, you have to. I mean, as I, I'm, I'm repeating myself, but I think it's worth repeating. Uh, it's not a luxury. It's a necessity to escape I think or right. give yourself respite. No, I think you're absolutely right. Couldn't agree with you more. Let's talk a little bit about, you know, you have such a, such a colorful background, um, you know, having, having grown up in the, in the family that founded the Sheraton chain of hotels and having married into the Purdue family. Um, so tell us a little bit about what it was like growing up uh, with your dad, having founded the Sheraton chain. Um, you must have had, you know, dignitaries and, you know, heads of state uh, come, you know, pass through your, uh, your living room. Uh, what was it like being, uh, you know, growing up in that environment? How about, uh, I mean, if I, I could almost think that I'm dreaming it because it was so much fun. But I guess the major thing that I take away from it is that both father and mother put an enormous amount of effort into the way they put it is avoiding having spoiled children. And we, we had chores, we went to public schools, we traveled uh, you know, by subways and buses, uh, except when we were traveling on business reasons, in which case we were staying at the presidential suites of 400 hotels. So, but I, I, I admire, in retrospect, I admire them no end because they really did put a lot of effort into trying to have us be aware that there's a world outside the bubble of, how about filthy stinking wealth? I mean, they, they, they recognized that if they didn't give us some kind of grounding, uh, that we could fall into the trap that I've seen too many people fall into. If you've got all sorts of resources, uh, you spend it on, well, yachts and racehorses and gambling. None of us did any of that. Uh, all of us worked, all of us uh, live infinitely below our means. And father told me that the greatest pleasure his money ever gave him was in giving it away. So he was an enormously philanthropic person. Uh, I mean, I, oh, here's another point that I would make for any family. You know, father was certainly very, very hard working, but he took the time Every Sunday, we did go to church services, but after services, we had family hour. 
where he, you know, captain of industry, nevertheless would take at least an hour to instruct his children on things like values, things like, for example, well, telling us that we were stewards, that the, the money that was coming our way wasn't for us to spend in wild living. It was to be spent being responsible citizens and giving back. I, I loved the background that I had. That is, and you're, you're so blessed. Um, and not, and I don't say that purely from the standpoint of having uh, what many would consider a privileged upbringing. But, oh, I consider it a privileged upbringing. But, you know, I think you were blessed, and I think uh, any, anybody listening or watching uh, would agree, that you were blessed not only for that, that of course is a blessing, uh, but you were blessed for having parents who clearly understood the value of money and how to inculcate that value within their children. And so, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's amazing that you've, you know, gone from there, carved out uh, a, an incredibly successful career for yourself. Um, and, and look at what you're doing. You're, you're bringing more good into the world with your new book. Uh, and I think this is truly spectacular. This is perhaps your life's calling. And I think this is perhaps the way in which you would leave the most significant mark on this planet by giving people some shred of hope that they can turn to. And I think because it's, it's, a, uh, it's an easy to read uh, small book, not a, a dusty tome, as you mentioned, um, it's easy to, for people to pick it up and read it on a bus or read it on a subway, um, you know, have it on their nightstand. And if they, if they get up in the middle of the night and feeling somewhat, you know, disconcerted, it's a great thing to reach for and just flip through the pages, find a story. Uh, one of the things I like to do, and I, I don't know if you, uh, we, we seem to share many of the same values. Um, so I wonder if you do this, but often uh, I don't read books from the beginning to the end, especially books that are stories or anecdotes. Or it's a compendium of uh, different, different um, uh, articles and stories. I read them, you know, as they move me. So I might open to a page and, you know, just want to be surprised. So it's like if I have a book of poetry, I don't start with uh, the first poem and read all the way to the end. Um, you know, if I'm feeling like it, I would just crack the book open on a random page and let the universe suggest what I should learn and what I should enjoy that day. And I think your book lends itself perfectly to that approach. Um, well, you believe that we designed it as deliberately as possible exactly for that, because I, I don't think somebody's gonna sit down in, in a time of great stress. I mean, you're, you're worried about paying your rent or whatever it is that's, I'll, I'll tell you a worry that I had. My sister's 92 and she got COVID, uh, she beat it. But you know, we were last thinking of funeral arrangements. You know, this is, this is incontrovertibly a time of just incredible stress on so many levels. But you're, I, I think I coined this, but maybe everybody else uses the same term, but pandemic brain. Yeah. When you're suffering from pandemic brain, uh, your, your ability to focus and concentrate, how about goes down? And as a matter of fact, that's, that's one of the 40 tips that forgive yourself if you can't remember things just as perfectly as you could before. And I'm going to bet that a lot of people listening to us are in the same boat as a girlfriend of mine who had the following experience that I listened in on. She was, she's a certified public accountant. And uh, she was talking about a, or it, it was a board meeting where there was a charity that needed a million masks, face masks to distribute. And they come in, the, the vendor was selling them in units of 50. And for a CPA, the craziest thing in the whole world is to divide a million by 50. But she confessed, I can't, you know, I think Alzheimer's is beginning because I can't do it. 
you know, just something really simple. Sure. But other, other forms of what I call pandemic brain are things like you can't remember a date or your best friend's name. Stress will do that to you, which brings us right back to give yourself time for your brain to recover by, by giving yourself respite. But uh, I'm, I'm as sympathetic as can be with anybody who's going through pandemic brain of reading a whole book and focusing on it just isn't in the cards. No, the book is by your bedside and pick it up and read something that you will find uplifting. And I'd love to share an uplifting story if we have time. Yes, absolutely. Please do. Um, okay. We've always got time for uplifting stories. Uh, well, this is, again, it's from the book, but, and I'm going to give a shortened version of it. But it's, it's on a way of being happy. But I tell it from the point of view of Napoleon Bonaparte, who around 1800, 1815, he was the most powerful man in the world. He was... He had all the honor, all the glory, all the wealth, all the territory, all the women that the world has to offer. At the end of his life, he's writing in exile and it's not too far before you know, he goes to his great reward. And he's writing and he says, I cannot remember in my life five happy days. So all that honor, glory, riches, it didn't do it for him. But in contrast, Mother Teresa, she had, she had a vow of poverty. So she only owned four things. She owned three cotton saris that she clothed herself in and the sandals on her feet. And she also had a, a vow of humility and her life's work was, or much of her life's work was taking care of the lepers in India. Well, so here's a woman whose entire life was, was opposite of Napoleon. You know, he had money, power, territory, sex, everything. She had, in comparison of the worldly goods, how about pretty much nothing? Sorry. So what, did that make her miserable not to have those things? No. In a, in a biography I read of hers, she describes her life as a feast of unending joy. So Napoleon, with, with all the honor, glory, riches, sex, money, whatever, it didn't make him happy. But a life of service and of giving and of taking care of others gave her a life of a, a feast of unending joy. And that brings me to something that Frank Perdue, my late husband, used to say. You want to be happy? Think what you can do for somebody else. If you want to be miserable, think what's owed to you. And so that's, that's the happiness. Well, there's several happiness tips in the book, but that's among my favorites. Think of what you can do for others, like Mother Teresa, rather than what you can take from others, like Napoleon. You know, I think you, you make a really, really good point. And, you know, from that measure, you are among the happiest people in the world because you're doing such good work in getting this fabulous book out there. Uh, I'm really looking forward to talking to uh, Mark Victor Hansen and Preston Weeks as well, but I cannot thank you enough, Mitzi, for taking the time out of your busy schedule to spend with us and share your wisdom and your background uh, and all of the, the fun stories and recollections that you've, that you've got with our audience. Thank you so much. It's been an absolute delight. Please come back and see us again. Oh, uh, before we go, one little thing. I was going to say, please come back and see us when you've sold a million copies of the book, but you have a good story associated with that. I do, and I'm going to hold it up for you. Uh, let's see if we can get close enough so that the camera there will- There you go. Yep, we can see us. That, does it read right here, more, more than a million, million copies, copies sold? Us. Yeah. Okay, now that's not actually the truth, but it's a very, very important point, and it comes from Mark Victor Hansen. One day, uh, a couple of weeks ago, he said, Mitzi, you know Photoshop. I want you to create a dummy cover. I mean, the, it's the real cover except for this part here, the more than a million copies sold. 
He said, I want you to create a dummy copy like that and then make copies and put it up in your office, in your bedroom, in your kitchen, you know, everywhere in the house, put copies of this because I want you to visualize a million copies sold. And you know, to my absolute astonishment, uh, you know, shortly after that, I got this email from a woman I've never met, but she's from Taiwan and she had bought a copy of the book and now she was ordering 200 more. And then, you know, within like a couple of days of that, she said that she's connected with a chain of, I guess it's department stores, or I'm not sure, but stores anyway. And she wanted to know if there was a way of getting a, dis a further discount if she buys a thousand. So this visualization thing that Mark is talking about, good Lord, yay. It works, it absolutely works. Yeah. So, I'll, Again, I, I, I so much want everybody to see yes. the, the fun piece of advice that, that Mark Victor Hansen gives. Yeah. That's absolutely wonderful. And I know that that's going to happen. Uh, I have absolutely no doubt in my mind. So when that happens, um, we're looking forward to having you back on the show. would love to have you again. And I want you to be holding a real copy of the book with the real A Million Copies Sold. You've got a deal. Wonderful. Mitzi, thank you so much. It's been a delight having you. Thank you so much.